before I introduce our illustrious speaker, I just want to uh, say thank you to Elihu Rose, who sponsors the Elihu Rose Lectures in Modern Military History and sponsors my position here at New York University. I want to thank the History Department of New York University, and of course, I want to thank the Jordan Center of New York University for hosting this talk. And it is an honor and a privilege to introduce Wendy Z. Goldman, who is the Paul Mellon Distinguished Professor of History at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She's one of the foremost authorities on gender, labor, terror, and now also provisioning in the Soviet Union. Uh, she's author of numerous books, including Women, the State, and Revolution, Soviet Family Policy and Social Life, 1917 and 1936, Women at the Gates, Gender and Industry in Stalin's, Ru in Stalin's Russia, uh, Terror and Democracy in the Age of Stalin, The Social Dynamics of Repression, uh, and more recently, Hunger and War, Food, provision food Provisioning in the Soviet Union During World War II, co-edited with Donald Filzer. Overall, an excellent book, although there's a very questionable chapter about rations in the Red Army in that book. Um, <laughs> also the co-editor of The Ghetto and Global History, 1500 to the Present, and currently uh, finishing up, or have just finished, a project, Fortress Dark and Stern, Life, Labor, and Loyalty on the Soviet Home Front during World War II, forthcoming with Oxford University Press, which is what she'll be presenting from today. Um, her articles have been translated into a dizzying array of languages, including Russian, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, German, and Japanese. And um, she's a, a truly wonderful and generous senior colleague, as I can attest. So I'm going to turn things over to Wendy. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, thank you all for coming today. So actually, we have quite a bit to celebrate. We've got this beautiful day in New York City, and uh, we also had the um, 75th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, uh, which occurred on Friday and cor uh, corresponded with the uh, first Passover Seder, for those of you who are Jewish, as it did 75 years ago uh, when the last remnants of the ghetto rose. So. Uh, I want to talk today also about resistance of a different type and about food. So what I want to talk about today is actually a very, very small part of a very, very big book uh, that I've just finished with Don Filzer, which Brandon talked a little bit about. Uh, food is just one part of that book, which covers actually the entire Soviet home front. So there's a lot of uh, material. Um, I think that the uh, story of the Soviet Union in World War II is actually particularly relevant for us today in a lot of ways. Uh, we know that the 20th century was marked by this great battle between fascism and socialism. And capitalism in the 1930s actually appeared to offer very few solutions uh, to large numbers of people. And although it seemed, I think, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, uh, post-war period, as if fascism had really been permanently and forever defeated, now it's within a generation. I mean, my father fought in World War II, uh, that many of its ideas are resurgent. We have the intense nationalism, the racial and ethnic hatreds, uh, the demonization of refugees and immigrants, and even a kind of new populism uh, in Brazil and in many, many other places that has begun to resemble certain political elements of the 1930s. At the same time, the role of the Soviet Union in fighting fascism has largely been forgotten in the West. I think that the Cold War created a new narrative of the war, uh, one which really obscured, elided, or just kind of erased uh, the contribution that the Soviet Union had made in the struggle against fascism. When I teach a course on this and talk to undergraduates, very few of them, actually none of them know, that the overwhelming majority of Hitler's troops were in fact concentrated on what we call the <coughs> Eastern Front. Um, this was the largest military confrontation in history, and it was fought out on the Eastern Front. Here's where the bulk of the fighting took place. And the losses for the Soviet Union were simply huge. So I think estimates are now a little bit over 26 million people 
that was 15.6% of the pre-war population. And just to put that in just a little bit of comparative perspective for you, the United States lost about 418,500 people. That was 0.32% of our pre-war population. Uh, the United Kingdom, uh, 450,700, uh, less than 1.1% of the population. Now the Axis deaths were somewhat higher. Japan lost about uh, 3,100,000, uh, about 3.7% of the population. And Germany, higher still. Uh, estimates range from 6.6 um, .6 million to 8 million, about 8%. But nowhere, none of these countries lost, either in terms of absolute numbers or percentages, anything that was even close to what the Soviet Union lost. The country was marked by the war in other ways as well. And any of you who have ever had any contact with Russia or with the Soviet Union uh, before it collapsed understand how deeply the country was marked uh, by the war large parts of the Soviet Union were occupied by the Germans and their allies. Uh, 13, almost 14 million civilians were killed, either through bombings, uh, they were murdered in the occupied territories, starved to death in besieged Leningrad. Two of the six million Jews that were murdered by the Nazis were killed on Soviet soil. And again, we know mainly the story of the Polish Jews, but now much more information is coming out. I think it's sort of the vanguard of Holocaust studies about what happened in the Soviet Union. So the country entered a state of total war. All resources basically <clears throat> were channeled toward defense. Almost no consumer items at all were produced. There was no heat either for buildings or for workplaces. And you can imagine what that was like in situations where temperatures dropped, you know, well below zero for many, many months of the year. There was no soap, uh, which again, for months, sometimes even more than a year at a time, for workers particularly who were covered with coolants and oils and all kinds of hazardous chemicals, the inability to wash clothes, to get chemicals off of skin, for coal miners, I mean, or just even normal people, the absence of no soap uh, is something that's just unimaginable, I think, to us today. And there was a very sharp drop in the food supply. And this is a little bit of what I want to talk about today. Today I actually want to talk about food substitutes, so a very small part of this story. But just let me give a little bit back of background before I get to this question of food substitutions. So for many years, I think very little was known about the full extent of hunger and starvation mortality on the Soviet home front. Although during the Brezhnev era, the Soviet state built an entire identity around the victory over fascism, many challenges and difficulties of the war years were erased. Um, so Soviet school children, for example, certainly learned about the siege of Leningrad. They learned about the difficulties of war. They had parents and grandparents who had suffered through the war and gone through it. But no one, at least officially in the his among historians, for example, or in the newspapers, discussed the uh, full extent of starvation mortality on the home front. And I think the full extent of that suffering was to a large extent hidden by Soviet leaders, which again is not to say it wasn't passed down within families, but from an official point of view, it was hidden. So until the archives opened in the early 1990s, neither Soviet slash Russian historians or Western historians actually had any idea about the full extent of hunger and starvation-related mortality. I want to talk a little bit about that too today. 
So we know the invasion occurred uh, without warning, without any diplomatic warning or anything, on June 22nd, 1941. And the Council for Evacuation, the Soviet Po Evacuatsi, immediately uh, was formed within about three, four days of the invasion. And one of the very first things that it began doing was actually not shipping out industry, although it comes to do that as well as more and more territory is lost. As a matter of fact, I think we might be able to say that this was the single most important thing to winning the war uh, in terms of provisioning the Red Army with um, uh, the ability to fight. Um, but uh, they immediately began shipping out people, uh, children, uh, grain, herds, and the food processing factories because they understood right away that a lot of that was concentrated in the West and there was the danger that it was going to be lost. So there were immense rescue efforts and these are quite amazing stories of uh, moving cattle in vast herds, you know, like two miles ahead of the Blitzkrieg um, over bridges that were being bombed and, you know, to try to get stuff as far east as possible. But the rescue efforts were not always successful and um, uh, a lot of things were in fact lost to the Germans. Uh, that's a whole other story, but I'll be glad to answer any questions people have about evacuation. The first three chapters of the book are actually deal with this whole issue of evacuation and resettlement. On July 18th, so then this is less than a month, within a month of the invasion, um, the Soviet leaders uh, immediately created a rationing system. It was clear that some form of rationing was going to be necessary. And that rationing system gradually encompassed all urban inhabitants, and all rural waged workers. Peasants were not provided with rations under the rationale that they were actually food producers and they had the private plots uh, from which they could live. So by late fall of 1941, so six months into the war, um, all urban inhabitants and rural wage workers were guaranteed now, at minimum, bread and sugar. Bread was the mainstay of the ration. It was the most important part of the ration for the vast majority of people. But depending on one's geographic placement and one's placement in terms of occupation, people were also guaranteed a wider array of foods as well. <coughs> Unlike in the United States or Britain, for example, where um, Rationing essentially meant restriction. So you're entitled to one pair of silk stockings a year, or you're entitled to so much of this. It, it, the idea is restriction. And food and goods were also available for commercial sale fairly widely. In the Soviet Union, rationing did not mean restriction to people. It meant provisioning. There was no food and no goods available for commercial sale. So again, this is I think a hard thing for us in America to get our minds around, but basically you could not go into a state store or any store for that matter and buy an item that was off ration. There was nothing like that being sold. Uh, so no commercial sale of goods. There was a hierarchy of provisioning. And I'm just going to give you the most basic sort of uh, fundaments of that, uh, even though it became far more complicated as the war went on. At the top of the hierarchy were workers. Then beneath workers were white collar employees. So for example, all of us would have been within that second category. Then adult dependents. These were people that were not working, either invalids, people on pensions, in other words, adults uh, who were not attached in some way to some other institution. And then below that were children under the age of 12. So those four categories uh, are roughly the um, way that uh, the provisioning system worked from top to bottom. Extra food was also allocated for children uh, through special milk kitchens, for example, 
Um, there were special feeding programs toward the end of the war, beginning in 1944, that were aimed at bringing people back from various stages of starvation disease, where they could get supplementary foods. Uh, special uh, additional foods were provided for workers in hazardous <coughs> shops or in chemical industry. At that time, there was the thought, and I don't know if this has any scientific basis, but that milk was useful for purging certain um, chemicals from the human body. So workers in chemical plants or ammunition plants, for example, could get extra milk. And of course, pregnant women, nursing mothers, also had access to extra forms of supplementary food. Um, so the thing that, in understanding the food system, it's important to understand food is not allocated by individual. What you're going to receive is completely dependent on the category to which you belong. It's a very different way of thinking than how we think here, where we think completely in terms of um, individuals. It's all dependent on the category to which you belonged. So if we take a look, what are the basic principles of the ration system? Well, the first, most obviously, is the labor principle. So those that expend more calories uh, are going to get more food. So for example, a coal miner is going to get more food than a bookkeeper. Somebody that works in a, a blast furnace is going to get more food than a professor. Uh, so that's the labor principle. Calories out, calories in. Um, the second principle that you can see throughout it is, as well is vulnerability. So people in hazardous occupations, children, uh, nursing mothers, uh, pregnant women. These are groups that were considered to be particularly vulnerable, um, in need of extra supplements, and so you see that principle as well. So we could talk a lot about the rationing system, but I'm going to move off it now. And, you know, if you have any questions, I'll be happy that we can talk a little bit more about this. In 1942, the Germans conquered more territory. And at that point, uh, more men were called up into the army, uh, women as well, and uh, the demands of the army increased. So by 1942, the country began to enter into food crisis. And it became clear to state leaders that there was simply not enough food to provision both the Red Army and the civilian population through central state stocks or through rationing. Once the state recognized that central state stocks alone, in other words, the ration, was not going to be able to cover the food needs of the population, it began to organize actively other sources of food provisioning for the civilian population. So the first was large subsidiary farms, or state farms, uh, sovkhozy or kolkhozy, uh, collective farms, were attached to particular factories. So for example, a large defense factory, if there was a state farm next to it, the state farm would deliver a percentage of its produce <coughs> directly to the factory, which then that amount of produce went directly to the factory canteen, to the stolovaya, where the workers were then fed through the additional produce. It also, state also began encouraging through a set of legislation and law, decentralized provisioning. In other words, they encouraged all local institutions. They could be schools, daycare centers, hospitals, factories, workplaces, to initiate um, contracts with local food producers where rather than the local food producer giving all of the food to central state stocks, in other words, turning it over to the state, that there would be local contracts that were created. This also helped relieve some of the stress on the railroads because of the shipping costs and um, the uh, boxcars. And this was also another way of sort of encouraging uh, more feeding on the local level. There was a huge movement, and we had a similar one here too, um, 
of both collective and individual gardening. Every factory, every um, high school, every daycare center, you name it, um, had a garden. And uh, people worked in those gardens. And people, also individuals, had gardens as well. So every square bit, Washington Square Park, would have been turned over to planting potatoes. Um, potatoes were the signature food of the war. They are easy to grow. They require relatively little weeding. And the potato itself is actually a very good food. Uh, it has not a great amount of protein, but uh, a fair amount of protein. And of course, quite a bit of carbohydrate. Uh, and count some good calories. So potatoes, everybody began growing potatoes. Um, and actually, by the end of the war, about 12% of people's caloric intake was from individual and collective gardens. So that's not bad. And then finally, uh, we often see socialism as being very anti-market. But I don't think it's such a strict <coughs> dichotomy between socialism versus the market. In this case, um, the state strongly promoted collective farm markets. So it encouraged the peasants to take whatever food they were growing on the private plots and market it in the urban areas. It actually set up stalls and booths and water supplies and other things so that peasants could come into the towns in order to sell the produce. Now, of all of these sources that I've talked about, there's only one, however, where free market prices prevailed. In other words, where supply and demand set the price of the food. The ration was, the food was highly subsidized. Food in Los Stolovayas or canteens, highly subsidized. But in the peasant markets, uh, the Kolkosni uh, Rinki, there you could go in and you could buy food, but you were going to pay the free market price. And we have a lot of complaints from workers and other urban inhabitants over the immensely high cost of food in the peasant markets. But they were used, and uh, they did provide an important supplement. Most of the food, however, that people consumed was provided through rations. 68% of the food that people consumed during the war was provided through the ration. Okay, in 1942 to 1943, which is kind of the lowest point that's of the, uh, the nadir of food provisioning, people could not live on the ration alone. And civilians began to starve. In the eastern industrial towns, which were the very basis of defense <coughs> production for the Red Army. Um, starvation, tuberculosis, was the single largest cause of death for people of working age. <coughs> Huge numbers of workers in towns like Sverdlovs, Gorky, and other towns were actually in various stages of what doctors in Leningrad and in the Warsaw Ghetto had begun to understand as starvation disease. In other words, a disease that has a precise set of stagings that they began now to outline and to understand. So we have now a very large percentage of workers now entering into some stage of starvation disease. Uh, Fortunately, by 1944, more food had become available. So the food supply reached its lowest level in 1942. And mortality, however, from starvation reached its peak in 1943, which is not a hard thing in a way to understand, um, because even when the food supply improved, uh, there's a lag. Food deprivation takes its toll slowly. And um, often it takes both a slow toll and even an irreversible toll. So there is a point in starvation <coughs> disease, if we think of it now as the doctors do, which is as a st set of stages. There's a point in the final stages 
where the damage cannot be reversed. In other words, the body begins now to consume its own organs. And at that point, um, you know, you've consumed the fat, you've consumed the muscle, you've now, when it begins attacking the organs itself, um, that's the point at which it becomes irreversible. So as in other places and times um, of famine, uh, people turn to forage, uh, they turn to food substitutes, uh, they turn to invented foods, now to begin to allay hunger and to try to provide the vitamins that they're missing from their diet. In the Soviet case, however, and this is the thing I really want to talk to you about today, so having provided some of that background for you, um, we see one difference, and that is that the state undertakes a massive campaign and set of initiatives of research, forage, and culinary experimentation. And this is what I want to talk a little bit about. This effort was collective, rather than being strictly individual. It was both state-sponsored, and it was creatively pioneered from below. So it's a very interesting set of initiatives that we now see. All kinds of people became involved in it, people from many different occupations. So we see um, scientists and nutritional experts, which we might expect, but we also see canteen cooks, bakers, officials in the Commissariat of Trade in Narkomtorg, uh, ordinary people are all participating in these organized experimental programs to supplement the food supply. And although memoirs, letters, and diaries from the war years frequently mention forage and other uh, food substitutes, no one has written about the larger collective efforts, which I think is a sort of missed uh, part of some of the things that did go on during the war. So how did experimentation begin? Well, experiments were both organized and spontaneous. And we can see the first experiments actually begin with canteen cooks. Why? Well, let me first just talk a little bit about the role of the stolovaya or the canteen in eating. So unlike in America today where we eat most of our, our main meal actually, usually the dinner meal is eaten at home and prepared at home, uh, usually by women, but not always. Um, in the Soviet Union, at the, during the war, due to a whole variety of factors. One, lack of fuel to, for the stoves. Um, two, women entered the workforce in massive numbers, which they had already done in the 1930s, but now we really see everybody is uh, working. Um, and they're working long hours. The working day was uh, 12 hours a day. Uh, and shift work in a lot of cases. So people were working day and night, uh, around the clock. And then, of course, we have millions of people that were organized by the um, Committee to Enumerate and Redistribute the Labor Force uh, that sent literally millions and millions of people to work in the eastern industrial towns or to work seasonally in a variety of different things. They were at home to cook. So anybody that wasn't home or had been sent to work somewhere else was living in a dormitory or a barrack. These barracks were not equipped with kitchens. Uh, frequently, they weren't even equipped with running water. And they were not equipped with heat. So um, people took their main meal at work in the canteen or the stolovaya. And uh, that institution became incredibly important to eating, this most daily basic activity. Canteen cooks were provided with a set of stocks that were delivered from central state stocks that they had to cook with. They received regular deliveries. Right away, certain ingredients that are sort of necessary to food preparation began to um, disappear. So almost immediately, um, canteen cooks began experimenting. 
So for example, in the Soviet Union, sugar was made from the sugar beet, not sugar cane. And um, that requires, like sugar cane, a certain uh, food processing. It requires a factory to extract the sucrose. Many of those food factories had either been lost to the Germans in the West, some of them had been shipped out, uh, and some of them had been, the machinery was simply sent and placed in defense factories. In other words, this turbine is not going to work to produce sugar, it's going to produce something else now. Um, so the uh, state just began sending sugar beets to the Stolobias, and the canteen cooks had to figure out what to do with them. And right away, they began doing all sorts of stuff uh, with the sugar beets. Um, they began producing a whole variety of boiled, semi-jellied preparations. So actually, the stuff, if any of us had been working during the war and gone into a canteen to eat, I think would have been somewhat unrecognizable to us as food. Um, similarly, uh, flour was the flour stocks also dropped precipitously. Now, bread, as I had mentioned to you, was the mainstay of the ration. It was the most important part of the calories you were going to get during the day. So it was very important. If a bakery closed because a uh, lack of fuel closed the water pumping stations in uh, a town, and then they couldn't get water to the bakeries or they couldn't heat the ovens, this was something that the party immediately launched an investigation in. So if people went without bread for three days, I mean, people were very close to the bone already. Three days without food was a serious loss. So the closing of bakeries merited immediate attention from the state and the party. That's throughout the archives. I mean, you could see all the correspondence. When the bakery shut down in Gorky for three days, there is a, that's a crisis um, that gets a lot of attention. However, they kept the bakeries running, but they couldn't keep the flour deliveries up. So they began sending potatoes instead. And here we have a huge set of uh, experiments with new recipes. How do you substitute potatoes or other grains for flour to bake the daily loaf that was the mainstay of the ration? And we have a kind of mass state campaign. So the local trade departments, the local um, begin to organize the bakers. And uh, they provide precise instructions on what to do with the potato and how to turn it into a kind of supplement to the loaf. Um, as a result, wartime bread, I'm still hoping somebody can show me what, can actually offer me a piece of wartime bread, you know, what it actually was. But it was soggy, it was gray, it was a weird admixture of stuff from what we read about it. Um, and it resembled bread, as we would think about it, in name only. Uh, but it was handed out regularly, and it was an important part of people's uh, caloric intake. Now, in the Stolovius, mainly what canteens, mainly what people ate, uh, especially in 1942 and 1943, was food was cooked in massive kettles and then portioned out to people. Um, it was primarily like a very thin gruel. It could be made with cabbage, frequently with a few pieces of potato in it, maybe some onion. Um, there was no fat in the soup, uh, no meat in the soup, and nothing really filling, thick in the soup. Sometimes they didn't even have cabbage, and they would put in just, they would throw grains in. So it's literally like a kind of gruel, a thin gruel. <coughs> not many calories, and many people began suffering from scurvy. So at that point, um, the state embarked on an active program of collective foraging and all kinds of experiments with canteen workers, unions, and food officials. So the union of canteen workers, which was really on the forefront of this, primarily women, mostly uneducated, uh, one generation removed from the peasantry frequently. These were considered low-level jobs. Um, they began doing an enormous amount of work, interesting work, with food. Um, they mobilized groups from the factories, for example, to forage for wild greens, for nettles, and for berries. Um, nutrition experts 
invented a coniferous extract. It was called a Khoininastoy. Um, it was a bitter concoction that was made from boiled pine needles or fir tree. In other words, coniferous evergreens. And it contained high amounts of vitamin C. Uh, it was used as a kind of juice uh, to counteract scurvy. It was known simply as hoya. Has anyone here ever drank that? Yes? Okay. Uh, I understand it tastes terrible. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, uh, people drank glasses of the foul tasting stuff. It was shipped out to canteens everywhere and um, throughout the country. It was produced centrally. In other words, as part of state stocks, they were actually producing this stuff. And it was also produced locally. And it may also have been produced by families in the home. So it was just a massive um, kind of statewide, individual, collective effort. Some of the big defense factories uh, organized vitamin production units. So just as there was the assembly shop and the blast furnace shop and the you know, ball bearing shop, there was the vitamin shop within the factory. Um, and one factory, for example, was producing 3,000 liters a day of Hoya, in other words, on an industrial level, uh, enough to give every single employee in the factory their daily dose of this stuff. So you think about these defense factories, right? You know, the tanks are rolling off the defense line, and right next to this, they're producing Hoya in the shop right next door. It's kind of a, a sort of dissonant, you know, idea. Um, the unions also organized workers and foraging brigades. So again, this was not individual, it was collective. People went out together as part of uh, union initiatives to gather edible wild greens. They gathered sorrel, nettles, and dandelion leaves for soups and for salads. And actually, the gathering of wild greens became a major uh, campaign <coughs> throughout the country. Um, the Commissariat of Trade, part of you know, the government, the state, took an active role in searching for new sources of vitamins. And they began vitaminizing or supplementing all of the um, soups that were prepared in the Stolovias. So for example, um, by 1944, all diners in the Stolovias were receiving, think about the scale here, 4.3 billion doses of vitamin A, B, and C. Um, nutritionists taught the canteen workers how to make their own concentrations of vitamin A from um, alfalfa, clover, uh, cattails, you know, in the meadows, um, timothy grass. They were using black currants, or rose hips, plantains, rhubarb flowers and greens, a whole variety of things now to make vitamin C and other things. And what's interesting is that many of the plants that were now being used on an industrial level were actually well known in folk medicine and also in folk um, practices. So the canteen workers, who were usually, I would say, less than a generation removed from the peasantry, they might not have had an education in medicine. They didn't really understand vitamins. They didn't understand um, the physiology of the human body. But they did understand that these things had been used by their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, part of the village. Uh, and they recognized the plants. And they recognized what was happening. So I think from an anthropological standpoint, oh, it's also very interesting it's like a kind of coming together of both scientific and industrial knowledge on the one hand, along with folk knowledge on the other. And it's coming together actually through the canteen workers themselves, mainly women, many illiterate. Um, and you know, you, to see that kind of level of thing evolve, I think, is quite interesting in a way. <laughs>
So for example, Uromash Zavod, which was the factory in Sverdlovsk that produced the famed um, uh, K-34 tanks, uh, they set up an entire experimental complex which produced a concentrated vegetable bullion from nettles and ash wheat. This complex functioned within the factory. It developed recipes, and then it sent the recipes out all over the country for how different institutions and factories could <coughs> replicate what it was doing. They made all kinds of purees, they made vegetable caviars, they made, I mean, all kinds of stuff, salads from weeds, um, all sorts of things. Uh, the holy grail, though, the absolute holy grail of food substitution is protein. So throughout the war, there was no meat, there were no eggs, there was very limited dairy. People had very little sources of protein in the diet. And that is a critical element, you know, for all of us. Without protein, people develop severe problems, um, from anemia to muscle wastage, I mean, all kinds of serious issues. So researchers began experimenting with yeast. And it was called a Bielkovia drozhizhi. It was a very, very rich source of protein, as maybe some of you who are vegans and take yeast supplements know. Um, and here, too, uh, this became a mass state initiative. So the first attempt to use yeast as a protein substitute occurred in Leningrad. It began in October of 1941 as the city began to starve. And a young professor in the Leningrad Forestry Institute suggested that this might be possible. And they began experimenting with growing yeast and adding it to food supply. So scientists turned out the first usable batch in the winter of 1941-1942. And soon, this stuff was being grown everywhere. Um, local trade departments, scientific organizations, nutrition departments, and the factories were all growing yeast and shipping it out throughout the entire country. Tons of this stuff was being shipped. I mean, it was on an industrial scale. Nutritionists were growing it on solutions made from water that was used to clean the potatoes. They were growing it on millet husks on peas and even wood shavings. When they started in Leningrad, they grew it on sawdust. So evidently, it can be grown on a variety of non-food um, uh, bases, of course, which is very important. Uh, the yeast was produced as both a paste and a milky liquid, and it could be added to soup kettles. The problem, of course, is that it tastes disgusting, maybe even worse than Hoya. So the idea was, how can you disguise the taste of it? Uh, and again, lots of experiments with how to, dis how to disguise the taste of adding this now to the kettles. Um, they also began experimenting with how to extract protein from oil cake. Does anybody know what that is? So when we use um, oil to cook with in the kitchen, we use uh, vegetable oil, we use uh, oil sometimes from soybeans, we can use oil, canola oils, um, safflower seed oil. After uh, the vegetable matter is pressed and the oil is extracted, you're left with a mass of fiber. That's usually either repurposed in today as fertilizer for fields, or it's fed to animals as far. Um, they discovered, though, that it was possible now to repurpose this mass of fibrous material as, um, and make uh, bullion cube, uh, cubes out of it that had quite a bit of protein. And literally billions of these bullion cubes now uh, were being produced. So by 1945, all of the canteens are now um, providing people who are eating them with a special 
vitaminized course. In other words, there was a special course that you received that was a supplement to whatever else was on your tray that was made up of substitute foods and was sort of aimed at meeting deficiencies in the diets. So, okay, but let me conclude now. We're sort of running out of uh, time, I think. Um, but, so, you know, researchers often write about the Soviet war years, I think in terms of individual stories. And these are absolutely fascinating. They add an enormous amount to um, the human element of the war. But I think they leave out sort of two critical elements. One is that all human beings functioned within a structure, uh, a ration structure, a set of um, state structures, uh, and a set of state policies, public canteens, I mean, things that sort of structured human existence in that period that were very different from how we live today or how people even lived in the Soviet Union after the war. And I think we need to understand these frameworks in order to really fully appreciate the individual memoirs, diaries, and um, more affective uh, sources that we have for understanding history. And the second thing is that I think this is especially true maybe of Western historians, but because we're so unaccustomed to thinking about things in collective terms, our sort of natural default is always the individual, um, we leave out, I think, the collective initiatives, especially the state initiatives, that involved millions of citizens, local trade officials, unions, um, commissariat of trade, the canteen cooks, uh, workers, researchers. In other words, we, we lose this element of the collective. So this story that I've just told you today about foraging and food substitution is a small part of what happened during the war. Um, but I think it shows us not only how individuals survive uh, in times of famine, but a more unique and unusual story, actually, of organized state and collective efforts um, to invent and produce a wide range of foods uh, to keep people alive. And in the defense factories, these crazy foods that I've described uh, literally fed the bodies on the home front that produced the weapons that made that victory over fascism possible. So if you trace it back, you know, from Brandon's work to who put those rifles and those tanks on the field, it was the defense workers. And what fed the defense workers was all of this nutty stuff. Um, and this sentiment is actually captured in a, a short poem that was written in the war, uh, written about the war uh, in Russian, um, which I translated. I'll read it to you in English. But um, would you want to come up and just read the Russian with me? Because I have it in the Russian. So why don't you read the Russian verse and then I'll do the translation? Because you can certainly read much better than I can. We ate everything we could eat, and we didn't want to be afraid. Могу все травы перечесть, которыми тогда питались. Полынь, крапиву, лебеду, с берез побеги молодые, чтобы на висшую беду прогнать на веки вековые. Wormwood, nettles, quinoa, young leaves of the birch tree to banish forever and always the gnawing misery. И кроме трав, столярный клей, ремни солдатские варили, и стали мы врага сильней, и начисто его разбили. We boiled the belts of soldiers, ate grasses and joiners glue, growing stronger than the fascists. We broke them through and through. <laughs>
we have plenty of time for questions and comments. So would anyone like to get us started? So you spoke a lot about this in the, in the passive voice, but where where did these initiatives come from? Was it from the Moscow itself, from the more local branches of the party, or was it from the party or the government? Can you just talk a little bit about the political logistics of how these things are done? I think it's a mix, actually. So in the beginning, as I said, um, the uh, canteens were receiving foods that they didn't know what to do with, like sugar beets. Uh, now that clearly, that's from below, right? The workers, they have a huge crates of this stuff. They don't know what to do, what do we do with it? So they start experimenting. They're not going to throw it away. Uh, they began boiling it and creating all kinds of stuff. That's, you see that as kind of both local, decentralized, there's no instruction from Moscow. Um, but then, uh, you know, when we speak about the state, we have to break it down, right? So. Um, Stalin's not sending out recipes, but uh, Narkontor, or the Commissary of Trade, begins to take a very, very active role in all of this. And um, by the time they get to the point where they're creating uh, vitamin shops in the um, factories, I, and, by, and certainly by the time they're growing yeast and shipping tons of this across the country, so the Commissariat of Railways is involved with this, right? I mean, you have to make boxcar space for shipping yeast. So you can see very um, high-level government structures are then involved in uh, additional food supply. So I would say uh, from the very top, I mean, you know, the GKO, um, the uh, State Committee of Defense, they made how many decrees over the course of the war? I think it's like 1,600 something, right? I've never been through every single one of them. They're in the archives. It would take a long time, and I don't know if it's worth it. But they decreed on a lot of very small stuff, actually. You might even be able to find, you know, come 1942 spring, I'd start looking around there, decrees. That's the apex of the government pyramid something on yeast growing. Uh, first of all, thank you for the book uh, and the uh, story, because no book has been written in Russia, and we know really. Uh, secondly, by way of introduction, my parents spent the war in the industrial city of Nikki, the guild of the Europe, uh, 42, 43, and I was born in 1943. So it's a family story, so to speak. Uh, but <coughs> the question I would like to get eventually to is that during those years, during the war, before the war, even after the war, 46, 47, there were many contingents of people who ate very little and worked hard. For instance, uh, people under German occupation, or people who were millions of them who were shipped to Germany to work. And they also had rations. They ate on the in the canteen. Uh, right? They know they knew all. And of course peasants during famines, if you read any autobiographical narrative by a Russian peasant about 1932-33, you will find all the food supplements yeah. that you just quoted right there. <coughs> Has there been any comparative study of how people survived or were fed to barely survive? For instance, the Germans provided exclusively turnip. That was staple number one in, in for, uh, for labor. East, post, I right, yeah. for mm -hmm. in, in Germany. So do you know any kind of There's a wonderful situation? book. It's called A Taste of War by Lizzie Collingham. And she, it's a big fat book. Um, it's primarily based on secondary sources, but it's comparative. And she looks at um, Germany, the Soviet Union, Japan, Britain, and I think the United States may be in there as well. Uh, and she provides a lot of comparative data on uh, food. 
is um, is very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, I want to <clears throat> sort of piggyback off that, that last question. Um, I know that so yeah, you, you mentioned that you know, starvation disease is this phenomenon that was observable in Leningrad under, under the uh, siege and in, in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, but as we sort of just alluded to, the Soviets also had quite a bit of experience with starvation in more, shall we say, controlled circumstances, specifically, you know, the Gulag. Um, and this talk actually, I think, serves as a very interesting counterpoint to the, the talk that um, Gopal Asopoulos gave here two weeks ago about medicine and research in the, in the Gulag. Um, and she pointed out also that they're similar to the rationing system that would then exist for the broader Soviet state. There was rationing within the Gulag based on one's physical capacity to work. Um, and then there was also very close observation of the ravages that one's body experienced based on deprivation of, of um, you know, food supply, of food provisions. <coughs> um, and so what, what I'm curious to know is, um, since the, the you know, Soviet state was clearly observing and recording and trying to learn from what was happening to people's bodies in the gulag, was there any sense of then transferring that expertise, those observations, and applying them to the broader society when they were facing such acute shortages on a much grander scale? Was, was there any sense that, of, okay, well, we see what happens you know, in your log when you right. take away people's food, did that then instruct them on how much they could then provision people to make sure they were still like, capable of working you know, on sort of you know, the, the most bare bone supplies? I'm not sure uh, how advanced the medicine in the gulag was in terms of starvation staging by 1941. Do you know? Did, um, I don't know. I mean, she, Global had some, some you know, images. I don't know if they were from before the war or from after, but they were just, yeah. all these stages of starvation where it comes down to like, you know, tissue collapse or collapses of all the. You know, but where the, was the, she? What years was she? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know from? Was, a lot of it was post war, but I don't know. It I, was post war. I think some so, of this, I don't know. I guess if it was post war, the answer to your question was is that the Gulag learned from the war. But I'm sure that there, I mean, and of course the Gulag also contributed to the war. So for example, in Nizhny Tagil, there were camps that were set up and where, um, so when the invasion occurred, large numbers, huge numbers of people were amnestied out of the camps. Um, they were released to go to the front. Uh, not political prisoners, but people that had been convicted for petty crimes and other things like that. Like, what? Like the punishment battalions. Like, no, no. They were just released to go into, they weren't put in punishment battalions, they were just released to go into the army. Um, punishment battalions, I think, is, for, is a different thing for cowardice and other things. but. That there was a mass amnesty in the Gulag uh, after uh, June uh, 1941. 600,000 people were sent either to the front or to the factories to work, uh, or they were just released because they didn't want to have to care for them anymore. Invalids, people that, um, you know, whatever, gone. Um, so, but of the remaining prisoners, healthy people who could work, were also used in uh, construction very heavily. And I should have actually said that the category below children was prisoners. Mm -hmm. They're very, very, very low. Um, what's also complicated, though, about figuring a lot of this stuff out is that just because your ration category gives you a certain level of food, it doesn't mean that's what you're being fed. So for example, in the great industrial complexes, the directors well knew, and they didn't need to be doctors to figure this out, that you can't get any work out. People who are starving cannot shovel, right? It's pretty simple. Um, so what they did was they actually took worker stocks, that was the main body of stock, and they would uh, give additional supplements to the prisoners. So figuring out what a prisoner actually ate and what prisoners were set to eat uh, is hard, right? But that's true for everyone. I would be very interested to know um, how much of this stuff was came out of the 1930s and how much of it came out of the war. As far as I know, the staging <coughs> of, the st of starvation disease 
uh, actually began in Leningrad in the Warsaw Ghetto, not in the camps in the 30s. Um, but that would be a good question to ask uh, Alpha. Uh, I have a question about how they, they thought about feeding people in the future. So you noted that, of course, children and pregnant women, for example, were seen as vulnerable, and therefore they were to be protected. But how did, how did they conceive of this sort of balance in terms of the future? You need people in the future, and yet these people cannot help you immediately win the war. Um, was this articulated uh, directly? Um, and I'm just, I'm just curious about how they thought through that problem. No, how do you mean exactly? Well, you yeah. don't want all the children to die because then you don't oh. have a future country, right? right? On the other hand, the children are not helping you win the war. That's right. So yeah. was this, yeah. this kind of terrible dilemma articulated directly? How did they think about it in terms of sort of future biopower yeah. versus we can't feed these little parasites? Yeah. I never saw children referred to as little parasites or anything I know, that's like me. that, or even like as um, uh, something that didn't deserve care. I never saw any record anywhere of that uh, in all the archive stuff that I looked at. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible dilemma, and um, you see it. In, it's not just with children versus workers. You see it with workers versus workers. You see it with. Um, uh, you see it in every family. Um, you see it in every, like, workers who have been evacuated from Leningrad versus workers that are already in an industrial city. Uh, it, you, the archives are just filled with, like, at one point I think I wrote, um, it wasn't like they were distributing food anymore, they were distributing hunger. So the question is taking from one group to give to another. So the one group that really, um, I think, benefited uh, unethically uh, from the war were officials. They were supposed to be provisioned as white collar workers, but they provisioned themselves. It's called Samosnabzhenya, they self-provisioned. And um, that was the one group where you saw intense resentment, especially among workers, uh, against officials. You saw that. Um, on the other hand, so one of the most common practices, for example, I said people were provisioned by group. Well, by the time you got to 43, often no stocks had been delivered to a city in order to feed the children. So th there were no stocks that were being delivered to feed the orphanage. So the, quest the, the, the factory got the stocks. As I said, all, everything was being channeled toward defense. So what did the party, local party officials do, or the local Soviet officials? They took the children and they had them eat their main meal every day in the factory canteen. So you could walk into any factory canteen and there were literally hundreds, sometimes thousands of people eating there who did not work in the factory. But that gets directly to your question. So it's not like, it's like if you and I are sitting down to have lunch, and then you and I, a thousand other people, are sitting down all together to have your sandwich, you're only getting a sliver of what you initially was allocated for you. And that's what happens to the workers, is that um, stuff that's allocated for workers is now going to feed children, et cetera, even under those circumstances. And that was where you could, workers saw who was sitting in them, next to them, right? It's not, in other words, all they had to do was see, and they knew. Um, I never saw one complaint about that, uh, about the children. But I did see a lot of complaints about the officials. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Uh, so did, what was the relationship between these strategies and, and feeding the army? Uh, that's for one question. And the second one is, uh, how long did the rationing system um, continue after the war? I mean, we know the win winter after the war was terrible, and, and uh, conditions were very, very difficult in the post-war years. So did the rationing continue? Well, we have the famine of 46. Yes. So I believe that rationing ended in 1947. Mm. And I don't think it ended uh, all at once 
Mm -hmm. um, it was a gradual sort of D, you know, they sort of dropped it gradually. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as the Army, I mean, as far as I know, and Brandon can probably answer this question better than I can, the Army was above the uh, civilian population. Yeah. So the Army got fed first. And um, did they use some of these same artificial vitamins and so on? Did some of this creativity well, then affect this, soldiers? Or this actually gets to a question I wanted to ask you, which is, and, and just a statement too, that everything that she describes in the civilian world, the Army does. Yeah. Absolutely everything. Uh -huh. The Hoi the Nastoi, the Hatsob Nehazyaistva, like, if you were a Red Army soldier, part of your job would be either substituting labor on a coal hose because people have been mobilized, or military units that were in the one place for a prolonged period of time had their own So mm -hmm. uh, the question, I mean, just to kind of piggyback on your question, do you get a sense how much of this is stuff that the military figures out first and tells the civilian mm -hmm. world, or stuff the civilian world figures out first and tells the military world, or is this one system that is so integrated that the typical kind of transfer between military and civilian worlds that we would that we would describe in a place like the United States is not a conversation worth having because of the type of system it is. Um, someday you and I will have to sit down and get all this figured out. But as far as I know, Anarchum Torque mm -hmm. did not provision the army. Oh no, the army provisions itself. Yeah. Right. But but, so but like the in terms of the transfer of knowledge. Transfer of right. knowledge so I'm just thinking of like, like the places where um, knowledge could have gotten. In other words, what are the state institutions <coughs> that instituted all of this on the home front, right? So you say the state. Okay, well, Narcom mm -hmm. let's say. But Narcom doesn't have a relationship to the army. Mm -hmm. So then you're looking for some super body where the knowledge could be transferred, right? I'm not sure. I don't know. Because well, Mikayana yeah. is doing both civilian and military provision you know, to a certain extent. He's well, that responsible would, for both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you have Julio, who is the guy who's responsible for the Gladman Pavlini Tila across the army, who is responsible for everything food, okay. and uniforms, and weapons, and fuel. And all that. Um, Did they, were they feeding them yeast also? No, because they didn't. They got meat. They didn't yeah. The army. And, yeah. and like, to your question, yeah. like, the same logic of the more directly, like basically the more directly you contribute to the destruction of the enemy, the better they feed you, mm -hmm. is in the army. If you're at the front, you get basically twice the amount of bread as people in the rear. You get a lot more, I mean, assuming that the food gets delivered, you get yeah. a lot more meat, you get a lot more everything. And there are people who join, there are people who could have gotten out of military service, particularly from occupied territories, who not only because of they want vengeance, but also because they know the army is where the food is, who joined the army mm. in 1943, 44, as the army's coming back through, or who are happy about being drafted because they know that that's where the food is, that's where the real bread is, mm. that's where you have a chance of getting meat, or you have a chance of getting tobacco, because there's only 25% tobacco production in the whole entire Soviet Union during the war, and the army is number one for everything. Um, and then guys who are involved in killing are number one for everything. And then in the just as you know, your, your officials are doing samasnabjenya, my officers are doing essentially samasnabjenya, where they're, they're even talking about taking them away from provisioning and having a separate category of provisioning just for officers because they keep stealing so much stuff. When, when do they do that? 40, they talk about it in 43. That's when they yeah. put in the stuff for, they put in laws about it, you yeah. know, the provisioning of officials to stop the samasnabjenya. I can briefly comment. Uh, you emphasized correctly that during the war, the whole enterprise became very much collective and frequently state-directed. But that's why the war was felt by everybody to be a very separate time frame. And to take the examples of collect of course markets before the war. The people who were selling there were Yedinalichniki or individualists who are not Kalkhoznik's. And they were pressed uh, horrendously. Uh, and the same after the war. So that, when you emphasize that, I wonder if there's a danger that you uh, generalize this collective spirit of the war to periods right before and right after when, of course, the hunger of 
the founding of 1946 was because it was exported. The, not distributed in Croatians, but exported to buy industrial equipment. Um, so this is about the war, right? right. And um, I think what you see, what I'm describing is about the war. So I've actually worked on the 30s. Uh, it's a very different period. Um, and I have not worked on the post-war period. I mean, I've read it, but I don't have. So yes, you're right. It's about the war. Um, thanks, this was really wonderful. I, my question is, but again, it's about after the war. Did they invent anything that was good enough to keep? Or was this all sort of <laughs> wartime, disgusting, weird food? Or did they find something that was actually useful? As far as I know, not. <laughs> not like spam, for example. <laughs> no. Well, spam, my god. So that's so filled with fat. Yes. Right, that's exactly what they didn't have. Yeah. Um, a lot of the things I think that we reject today as being unhealthy were precisely what they needed. Uh, the wartime bread, certainly not. Um, no, but I like yeah. vitamins. I mean, none of the vitamins are useful. As far as I know, no. Um, I think, how long did you drink Hoya for? How long did you continue to drink Hoya? Well, I was made to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but for how long? Uh, as I recall it, uh, I, I still remember the taste, so it must have been at least three years old, but I don't know. So, but, 46, you think you were. Certainly you know. sorrel uh, 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 and um, nettles yeah. and everything you could that has vitamin C. Into the post war period. Mm. Yeah, but now, I mean, yeah. you know, you're not going to find that in... <laughs> well, they do nettles in French restaurants, but that's sure. different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> different kind of I you marmite. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh, yeah. I know, it's, sure. that's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but talking about the sort of the peasant markets that you brought up, for me, one of the sort of... Um, Present absences in the talk was also, and, and this also sort of relates to the question of um, self provisioning mm -hmm. among the elites, is, is the question, of course, of the black market. Um, and uh, so I'm, I guess my question is you know, you, you have these figures breaking down by, you know, how much people's nutrition was attained through racial rationing, through sort of um, you know, farming efforts. Was there any effort to also get to, to, to break down or, or, or um, itemize? How much people are being fed by misappropriated, um, you know, food goods, and also, and just a sort of a, a side question to that: um, did, did you see any record of people developing, you know, sort of behaviors like pika, or you know, like, like um, eating, like you know, non-food, you know, dirt or yeah, clay or yeah. things, just just for the sensation of, yeah. of being able to eat and, and for actually you know, mineral you know, deficiencies. So no on the pika, but on your first question, it's a very interesting question. So you just it gets you back to the statistical issue. Like how do we know what percentage of calories came from what, in a sense, or even what? So there are two ways of figuring that. One way, in the 1930s, the Central Statistical Administration, so, uh, so uh, what was it, Central, SIASU, uh, um, had um, elaborate budget studies that were running for families in different occupational levels, where they would follow a family or an individual for a month or two months, and the individual was asked to log every single thing they bought, their wages. In other words, you could see expenditures out, expenditure, and income in. Yeah, fairly simple budgets, but at that point, people had pretty simple you know, um, needs. Oh, everything, even down to tobacco. So during the war, all those budget studies stopped. I found in the archives, I think one of the only budget studies that they did that existed, uh, which was a budget study of workers in an industrial town, and they followed about, I think, 30 of them. Anyway, so that gives you that, you can see like, 
how much from the um, black market or the mark? It's actually the market. I mean, all kinds of stuff was being sold on the market. The only time it's black market is when it's stolen, right? I mean, otherwise people were trading constantly. Um, so you can see all of that stuff. And there's actually, I, I wrote a section on that in the book. Um, but the second way of looking at food is that um, the market doesn't produce food, right? In other words, the market just trades. So there's a set amount that's being produced, tonnage-wise, and then presumably the entire tonnage is being consumed. We don't know if it's being consumed exactly according to those ration categories that I gave you, but it's all disappearing. So that is the other way of looking at it. But what it doesn't tell us is what your question is, which is that how much leakage is existing between samosnabjenya, in other words, siphoning up, right? And also, there's also siphoning down. And I gave you an example of that as well, when children were placed in canteens and prisoners were given extra food. So there's an enormous amount of that. That's also ration categories are now bleeding into each other, but down below. So I think that, um, it, well, I would urge you to read that section on black markets in San Luis Navigenia, but I think in terms of quantifying it, it's very hard. So there's a lot of material on it, uh, which I wrote up, but I think it's very hard to actually set a quantity on it. Yeah? I'd be interested in knowing whether Pitter and Sorokin's early work on starvation immediately after the revolution had any relevance to what you were doing? Um, I have not read it, but I know that Rebecca Manley, who did a lot, of, who did all this work on starvation, disease, and the staging and all that, it's actually how I know uh, what I talked about, uh, she definitely <coughs> used that, um, that work. Mm, yeah. So. Have you read it? No, yeah. I have a copy at home, oh. but I haven't <laughs> gone through it yet. There. Any further questions? Okay. Please join me in thanking Wendy again for a wonderful talk. <laughs>